Sandra from the NR Hour Sports Show. This is episode 755. I'm joined by a really special guest today, Tony, Tony Gwynn Jr., a former MLB outfielder. Obviously, he's the son of le legendary player, the late Tony Gwynn. So I'm really looking forward to this interview. Um, obviously, he played for the Brewers, Padres, uh, Dodgers, and Phillies. So how are you? Uh, how are you and your family doing? Obviously, you're covering Padres baseball, too. So we're going to get into all that. But first of all, how are you and your family doing so far? Uh, Nathan, first, first and foremost, thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate the invite. My family is doing well. Uh, we have been uh, blessed during this uh, trying time for everybody, but uh, we're doing all right. Yeah, so before we get into your career, obviously this week has been is really important. Jackie Robinson Day uh, today and yes, I mean yesterday and today actually two days. So what has Jackie Robinson mean to you, your father, and, and the rest of the baseball? I mean, you, you know, you try to come up with like a a really in depth um, kind of thoughtful insight of what Jackie. But the, the bottom line is, I, I'm not sitting here having this conversation with you, Nathan. If uh, Jackie wasn't able to accomplish and endure um, everything that he did. Um, I, I remember playing in my first Jackie Robinson game, wearing the 42. And I think early in your career, you know it's special, but as your career goes on and you get more and more opportunity to wear it, um, especially as I got to wear it as a Dodger, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's, there's a certain responsibility you feel to go out and, and play well with that number. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I'm going to ask you another question about that later on, but I want to get to your playing career and your childhood. So while growing up, obviously your father played in the league, and um, did you once you saw your father play, did you did you say I want to do that too while growing up playing baseball? Not not at first, not at first. I I wanted to hoop at first. Oh. That was that was my first love. But as I got older, and you know, I got into high school, and you start realizing, you know, the guys on on the hardwood are six three six four six five and my dad was five eleven it didn't seem like I had much of a chance to to grow anymore and I was pretty good at this baseball game so um it, it came natural to me and it was something that uh, once I turned my focus to yeah uh my about my end of my junior year in high school I started to lock in on playing baseball a lot more and um that dream of playing in the big leagues came came the vision became more clear at that point mm -hmm. so um <clears throat> like when you were playing baseball in high school did you play uh, multiple positions before uh sticking with outfield uh once i got to high school um no i was i was moved to the outfield and um it was the right move for it, to be quite frank um they were better guys than me in san diego and at that time san diego was one of the top high school places in the nation. Uh, so I moved to the outfield and fortunately for me spending all those batting practices next to my dad in the outfield, it really wasn't a big transition for me. Um, it came relatively natural to me because I think spending so much time, especially on a high school field, it's, it's just completely different than a big league field. You're, 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 you're there, the balls are coming in at a higher speed. And so once you're, you're adept at catching a big league fly ball. There isn't much else that's going to really affect you. And so I took that, that experience with me as I made the change into the outfield and it went well for me. Hmm. So take me, uh, so take, take me back to your college days and what, what, what were the big things and big lessons that you learned as a college player before going into the draft and in the, in the majors? Well, I'll start by saying out of high school, I was drafted in the 33rd round, okay, yeah. which is, which is the 1000th pick. Exactly. And I knew even at that point that I was a much better player than the 1000th pick in the draft. So when I got to San Diego State on and I walked out of the campus, I was I was really motivated and on a mission to to prove to all of the teams that I was a better player than that. Mm -hmm. And so as I stepped on the campus, I think the first thing you realize is uh, once you get to college, there's a lot more talent on the field. Yeah. Like, and and, and you, it's the first time you really have to go out and compete. Like college is where I started to really hone my work ethic in. And it really was from watching upperclassmen 
not only on the baseball team, but on the football team and seeing the extra things they did to get themselves ready for the game. And um, I, I kind of started there. And, and I remember getting the first chance to start my first, one of my first games was against USC. And at that time, Mark Pryor was, well, he was, he was, the, he was the guy. And I remember getting in the box and I tell, I, I mess with him every time I see him. I remember getting in the box and looking out there and you see this like towering guy and his calves were so huge. That's the only thing I could remember, but I got a couple hits and I knew at that point, and this is as a freshman that this is Mark Pryor. This is the best prospect at that time. People had seen in a very long time. I can play at the, the next level. You know, I, I got to hone my skills here at San Diego state, but I knew at that point it was, it was like the, there wasn't much that I wasn't going to see from this point on. Hmm, interesting. Mark, Mark Parr, uh, <laughs> what a, what a great pitcher back in the day too. Awesome, yeah. awesome career. Um, so I want to ask you though, uh, take, obviously you made your debut with the Brewers. Uh, what, what was that like uh, when they called you up and, uh, and, and gave you the first opportunity to start your baseball career? It was, it was, it was like exciting and scary all at the same time. Like I remember I missed the first phone call from, from our manager, uh, Frank Krimblitz at the time I was with the Nashville sounds and it was my first year in AAA. I was having a really good start to the season. And uh, I remember getting the call or calling back, I should say. And, you know, the next call went to my mom and dad who were, who were so pumped. Uh, my wife at the time, fiance, uh, was, was super pumped. So I headed to Arizona where, um, you know, I walked into the, to the clubhouse. And the, the thing that I remember most is seeing my last name on a Jersey. Now, granted, I had seen my last name on the back of a big league Jersey before, but it wasn't my name. It, it was my dad's and to see, you know, at the time, the number 22 and in the Milwaukee gray with Gwen on the last, it was just like, it was, it was, it was everything you, you would dream it to be. Yeah. So what was it, what was it like playing for the Brewers in, in front of those fans? Obviously that ballpark is amazing um, in, in Milwaukee. So what was it, what was the atmosphere like for you? And uh, what, what, what do you like about that uh, team? It was so fun. It's probably the most fun I've had in the big leagues. Uh, you know, at that point, I'm getting to the big leagues with my, with my guys like Prince Fielder, Ricky Weeks, yeah. Corey. Hard, JJ Hard, like all at the same with one within one or two years of each other, uh, we're all coming up at the big league level. Um, all of a sudden, we add Mike Cameron to to the to the team, and I'm like being mentored by a guy like Mike Cameron. And then you know, a year later, CC Sabathia is on. I mean, it was. It was, it was, first of all, it was, it was a laugh session pretty much every time we got to the clubhouse, but we were good. We were really good. We were young. We were just now starting to, to kind of blossom as a team. Ryan Braun shows up and he, he only adds to it at that point. And it, it, that time was, was some of the funnest baseball I got a chance to, to participate in. Like I end up one year knocking, you know, my team out of the play, my, my hometown team out of the playoffs, facing a guy who I consider family and Trevor Hoffman. And then the following year, I get a chance to go to the playoffs for the first time. We would eventually lose to the World Series champion Phillies. But that experience to me was like, that's, that's, that was everything. Yeah, speaking of the playoff experience, obviously CC Zabat, they helped you guys out a lot. He, I think he, he put him, he put that team on his back when it comes he did. to um, so obviously I'm a Yankee fan and, and he pitched for us and what a great uh, pitch, a hall of fame career he, he had, uh, yeah. he, I, I, he deserves to be in the hall of fame in my opinion. But, um, what was it like just being on that playoff team and, and seeing CC Sabathia going out there every fifth, I mean, every playoff start that he had and they going just basically shutting down, setting down the opposing team. I mean, basically from August on, we were in playoff games and he, I felt like he pitched every third day like he was going so often and I remember them coming to him and he was like let's go like he was he was all about it and mind you he's coming up on free agencies like <laughs> he could have been like nah I don't want to do that it's too much of a risk but if you know CC that's not in his DNA like this that dude wants to compete 
He wants to, he wants to, to, if he can help the team, he's going to do it. And just being a, just being watching him go to work every third day, it seemed like watching, you know, Prince get on a roll there at the end of the season. Yeah. Um, it, it, it really, it really was eye opening to, to the type of talent I was around. And uh, I was able to contribute, you know, off the bench, but, those guys, those were the horses. And it was, it was just so much fun being a part of it because we, we had a lead and then it shrank and then we kind of had to hang on. There were some wild things going on. I think uh, Ned ended up getting fired right at the end of the season there. And we, we get into the playoffs and we just ran into a buzzsaw with, with Philly is what really happened. Yeah. But obviously uh, now, obviously now switching gears, obviously you play for the Phillies too, but I want to ask you about, the the, the 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 West the, the NL West when I mean, you played for the Padres and Dodgers so what was it like playing for both teams in the same division and the rivalry and obviously now uh the, it's I think the rivalry is starting to heat up again but when you were playing what was it like just playing for both teams in the same division? Um, it was it was awesome. Well, when I was when I had a Padre uniform on, there was nothing I loved to do more than to stick it to the Dodgers. Right? <laughs> it was that was what I enjoyed doing the most. Uh, I also got an opportunity to play on a consistent basis in San Diego. And um, obviously getting to play in front of friends and family is it's, it's irreplaceable. It's a team I grew up watching my dad. He didn't necessarily don these jerseys we were wearing at the time, the sand and the, the yeah. Navy, I think it was, but he had, he was a part of this organization. And so I grew up in it. So it was, it was, it was awesome to be here for the two years I got to be. And then when I, when I signed with the Dodgers, that equally filled, you know, uh, 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 something that, you know, I think a lot of people dream of. I mean, the Dodgers are historically like it's one of the historic teams of our game and getting to know the history of the Dodgers uh, as a guy who grew up loving the game was was next level. It was, it was awesome to be a part of that. And I, I got to be a part of that franchise as they started to make their transition into what the juggernaut they are now. So um, getting to play for Don Mattingly was awesome. Uh, I, I really enjoyed playing for him um, and getting to, honestly, getting to, to play, be teammates with, with Clayton Kershaw and, and Matt Kemp, uh, you know, D Gord. I mean, I enjoyed my time, Kenley Jansen. I enjoyed my time. Uh, those three years I got to play in LA. It was, it was really awesome. Did you get to play with Andre Ethier too? Or was I did. I got to play with Dre. I got yeah. to play with Dre. And I, you know, I I had known Dre for a while. I mean, we had played against each other coming up through the minors. Uh, and he was another good teammate. You know, Dre, Dre is a, he's a different bird, but he is definitely uh he was definitely fun to watch play. I mean, that guy uh could hit. He was he was a he was he was one of the best hitters I got to play with for sure. It seems like the Dodgers get lucky every year. It seems like they're loaded with talent every single year. And this Dodgers team, is, man, they're, they're not going to go away for a while. No, <laughs> for sure. no, they're not. The thing is, is, is not luck. You know, they, they have, um, they have the means, Hey, that, that part is, is an advantage, but they also evaluate and develop as good as anybody as, as an organization, as an organization, as good as anybody in the league. And I think that's what the Padres are starting to do yeah. out here is they're starting to evaluate talent and develop it. And, and as long as you can do that, no matter how much money you have, you can keep, you can keep being successful. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you this, how, what, what's it like just to live on your father's legacy and playing, uh, playing for the teams that he played for the Brewers and the Padres, what's that like just wearing the same uniform as your father? And I'm sure there's other, there's been other players like that who played, uh, same team with like their father did but for you what was it what's it like just to be, uh, do that in your career it was awesome I mean that was why I wanted to to come to San Diego was because you know not only did I live here but my dad played here he had a uh he had a a long career he only played for the Padres and for for me um the city got kind of got to see me grow up I was around the my dad all the time. So they knew me, they knew what to expect of me. It wasn't as though they saw the last name Gwen and were expecting my dad. They, they knew who I was. I, I played here as in high school, I played here in college. So um, I thought the expectations uh, would be fair 
and it would allow me to 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 be the best version of me and lo and behold i had i had my best year as a padre hmm. so um so looking back obviously you had a great in my opinion you had a great career too and uh you're known for the speed and so for you uh when you got on base how often do you uh how often did you uh fool uh fool the pitchers or like move around a lot did you move around a lot on the bases when uh when you're on no i didn't move around a lot i got my lead and, and i kind of settled in but it, it at the big league level stealing bases is, is about more than speed it's, it's yeah. about technique and it's about knowing pitchers tendencies and it took me a couple of years to really learn tendencies and when i got to san diego i was lucky because at that time Dave Roberts was uh was 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 on the staff. I don't know if he was on the staff, but he was in the executive side of things. But he would come down and work with us. I had Ricky Renneria, former mm-hmm. manager of, of the Cubs and White Sox. They taught me a lot about tendencies and and how to pick pick up those tendencies, what to look for. And I had the speed, I had the technique, but the tendencies kind of helped me, you know be able to be a more successful base still. And um, I credit the, both of those guys a lot with a lot of the stuff I learned. And then, you know, when in LA, I got to, I got to be around Davey Lopes, who yeah. I grew up, grew up with, with as a child, he was the first base coach for the pods when my dad was playing. So wow. I already kind of had a relationship with him and getting to, to learn from one of the best, like as, as, as Davey is, uh, I, I was I was truly blessed to to have those type of guys as coaches. Yeah. So look, this is a two part question. So now looking back at your career, how grateful are you to be able to, to play the game you love, uh, honor your father too, and um, and now switch now covering the game in a different aspect, seeing the game from the other side as a broadcaster. So what's it like just to play the game that you love and now seeing it from the other side? Uh, it's 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 a blessing, you know. It truly is like. God has allowed me to play a kid's game and make a good living doing it. And it's not work to me. It's, 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 it's something I enjoy. So, you know, having the opportunity to, to play for the coaches, coaches I got to play for, whether it was Ned Jones, Bud Black, uh, uh, Dave, Don Mattingly, as I said, I was truly lucky. I mean, two of those, two of those, well, one of those guys has won a world series. And, And so, um, I, I've been blessed from that standpoint to be able to, uh, my dad did, he, he, he left this legacy. And now the way I look at it is it's my, my job to carry that legacy on in the light that he would be the most proud. And so, you know, now on this side, as a broadcaster, I try to give off my love when I'm talking about the game. Like, I, I want you to feel my energy of 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 how I love this game so much when I when I speak about it and um, that's easy that's an easy part I'm, I'm passionate about it and I, I hope that my dad would be proud at this point. Yeah. So speaking of those managers, Bud Black, Ned Yost, and uh, Don, what you just mentioned, what are the what are the what was it like just learning from underneath those managers? And obviously, Don is a manager for the Marlins. I'm still going at it, and Bud Black with the Rockies. But um, for you, what what did you what did you learn, especially from those three? Well, it's 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 weird because I was young when I had Ned, and I don't know that I was always in tune like I should have been at that point. I, everything when you're young at the big league level, yeah, everything is happening so fast, and you're just trying to play catch up for a lot of times, and so you know. I wasn't a guy who was starting every day. So I, I, you know, I was, I was trying to learn as much as I could from as many different spots. So I think Ned kind of came into his own as a manager once he got to Kansas city, but I'm sure there were lessons I missed because <laughs> it, everything was going so fast for me yeah. at times. By the time I got to San Diego, um, I had a little more time under my belt and things were a little bit slower. Uh, I have, uh, a, a certain affection for, for Bud Black. I mean, first he's a San Diego state Aztec. So me and him are already on the same page there, but he just had a way of communicating that was um, it was ideal for me. I, I didn't feel uncomfortable going in his office, asking him a question at that point and knew I would get a straight answer from him. And, and I think as a big leaguer 
as player in general, that's really all you want from your manager yeah. is, is to be honest. Cause if, if he's honest with you, then maybe there's something that you can do to improve whatever it is that you're not doing. If he's not, you don't really know. It's you're kind of just left out there trying to figure it out on your own. So that was one of the things I, I loved about Bud. Um, and then getting a chance to play for Don. I mean, listen, Don was was one of the guys when my dad was playing. Like he was one of the best hitters in the game. If not for his back, uh, I mean, we arguably could be talking about Hall of Fame with with the back issues, but he would definitely be having this conversation and has had his back been a, a little healthier. And so getting an opportunity to play for him, same similar style, very honest. Uh, me and him definitely had our disagreements at times, uh, but he was honest. And even though I might not have agreed, um, I respected it. And when I look back on it now, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative of it. And I know, you know, those guys in Miami are getting a chance to to deal with them. And I'm, I'm sure they I'm sure most of them feel the same way. Yeah. So now switching gears to your broadcasting career, what's it like now covering this Padres team? Obviously, you've seen them grow from, from the past years to now and see made the playoffs last year and improving every year. And what's it like uh, seeing like, uh, would you say this team reminds you of when you were with the Brewers in 08? No, because this, you know, all the guys that came up in, in, in Milwaukee were all homegrown. I mean, we, we kind of added a couple splashes here and there with a CC and, and bringing in Mike Cameron. But for the most part, the core of the team was made around all guys that were part of it. It, right. it probably is more like Kansas City's run back when they won the World Series than, when it, than it is with the Padres. The Padres had to change the culture. And so – they had to kind of do two things simultaneously. They had to have some type of young talent coming up, but they also had to go out and bring guys in who were winners and, and, and who could create a culture here that, you know, could, could kind of bring along a winning tradition. And the first step, I know people tend to focus on, on Manny and clearly that's a, a huge, huge, uh, get for the Padres. Yeah. Nobody in San Diego ever thought in a million years <laughs> we would sign a guy for 300 million. But not only is he worth it, he deserved it, right? And the Padres went out and got him. But the first domino to fall was Eric Hosmer. Yeah, Eric Hosmer. E e Eric Hosmer comes first, and I'm not sure we even get a chance at Manny, uh, or or for 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 that sake, Blake Snell and all these other guys who yeah. come in a couple years later. I'm not sure we have an opportunity without Eric being the first one to dive in. And uh, he kind of brought that culture with him of winning. It took a couple of years to kind of come together. Uh, you bring in Manning the Manny the following year. And by the time it's year three for, for Haas, we're, we're, this organization is a playoff team. And I think it, it's, it's a large part due to AJ Preller and understanding how the puzzle comes together. You can't, he, he had an experiment and I think it was 14 or 15 and the pieces just didn't fit. All good players, all super talented, but the pieces didn't fit. These pieces actually fit together. And now he's added depth to the team. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a game changer for the pods. Yeah. Like for like <laughs> now you bring, you have Fernando Tatis who just signed the monster deal, but he's injured right now. I wonder how long he's going to be out for, but uh, the, the lineup is still crazy good. And uh, the pitching staff, uh, Blake Snell, you Darvis, Chad Paddock, and then you, you got you got a lot more depth. When Mike Clevenger comes back, oh, my God. What, 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 so what do you do you think um, – obviously, it's still early, but do you think they have a chance to um, take the Dodgers to, to make the run for the Dodgers for the division? Or Yeah, no, I do. I think they got a chance. I mean, they got to stay healthy. Yeah. Uh, they came into the season a little banged up. Bullpen was a little banged up. By the way, that depth I'm talking about has had to kind of show up because you miss a Fernando Tatis Jr. You're missing two or three or four bullpen arms, yet they probably have the best pitching in, the, in, in Major League Baseball from a statistical standpoint at this point. And so um, I think they got a chance. Somebody's got to have, a, you know, much like last year, somebody's got to have an MVP type season doesn't necessarily mean they'll win it but they got to have a MVP type season and 
Um, because listen, the Dodgers aren't going anywhere. That's, that's just the crux of the matter. Like they, they got better actually during the off season, you know, you get to bring price back who set out, you sign Bauer. Uh, they're a team that you, you can't, you have to acknowledge is the best team in baseball right now. The Padres get a chance to measure themselves tonight uh, for the first time. Yeah. So who, what's it like now broadcasting games for the Padres calling and seeing this team uh, develop. And obviously I had your co uh, co-worker Jesse Agler on the show too, uh, like a couple months back and he's awesome to talk to. And uh, what is it like working with him and the rest of the crew now? Uh, well, I love Jesse, man. I, I've, I've got a chance to work with him over the last, what, four years now since I've been with this organization and he's been awesome to me. And uh, I, I think he's one of the most talented guys we have in our business. Um, and I really enjoy working. As for doing the games, I mean, here's the thing. <laughs> good, good teams take a long time. And so these games have been extraordinarily long. I mean, we played, I don't, I think we played two games under three hours all season long. The rest have been over three, a couple have been in the four hour. These are nine inning games we're talking about, not, uh, not extra innings. I just think, um, I just think for the Padres or at least doing the games, that is how they're going to, they're going to win. It's much like the Dodgers, the Dodgers will methodically, just keep wearing you down. They see a lot of pitches. They foul a lot of pitches off. We've kind of seen that here in San Diego in the early going. So uh, what do you think of the Padres? Uh, obviously coaching, they have a heck of a coaching staff. You got like Skip Schumacher on there too. And uh, what do you think of the manager? Uh, uh, I, I don't want to say his name wrong. Is this Jace, Jace Tingler? Yes, yeah, Jace Tingler. Yeah. What do you think of him so far? Uh, I love Jace. I, 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 I'm a little biased. I've known Jace. I, I played with him in, in college in the Cape Cod League. Um, he's, he's, he's a solid dude first, but he knows his baseball. He's smart. Um, he's a, he's a student of the game. Um, he, he has, he has done a terrific job, um, in his short tenure here with the Padres. And I think he has also helped set the culture of how, how they want to go about their work. Um, he, he is he when he's talking to the media, he's very Belichickian, if you will. He, he's not he's not going to give you much. Uh, but in terms of how the game is ran, I think he's done a, a terrific job and he's got a great staff. I mean, Bobby Dickerson is considered one of the better infield guys in the game. Wayne Kirby is a terrific first base coach. You mentioned Skip, who I think is destined to be a manager at some point here. Um He's got a good staff to lead, lead, lean on. Larry Rothschild certainly has has, yeah. has been able to handle pitching uh, rotations and, and bullpens for a very long time. Um, this this the staff is 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 as good as it gets, I think. Yeah. So, what advice would you give uh, to these young baseball players or young athletes that are trying to reach reach their goals? Uh, the biggest advice I, I would give them is is stay stay on the grind. Um, the moment you start to pick your head up to, to look around what you've done, somebody's already passed you. And too often, and it's human nature, right? You, you, you go, you, 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 wanna, you wanna at least enjoy some of the success and you can, but just know that the moment you stop to, to enjoy, somebody else continues to keep working. And, and if you wanna stay competitive, you, you, gotta, you gotta keep your head down, keep working. So now we do this fun little segment on the show. It's called the rapid fire segment. Uh, do you have time for a quick rapid fire segment? Let's do it. All right. Kawhi Leonard's laugh or Kevin Hart's laugh? Kevin Hart's. Um, so I'm going to put you on the spot here. Uh, favorite bowl of best atmosphere, Miller Park or Petco, Petco Park? Oh, that's a tough one. I would say right now Petco Park. Okay. But in the past, Miller Park probably has it surpassed. Uh, favorite memorable game that you played throughout your career? Uh, probably the game that knocked the Padres out of the playoffs in, in 08, 07. 07 or 08, one or two. 07, 07. Um, all right, who's the funniest teammate that you played with? Funniest teammate I ever played with. Um, 
Man, I'm racking my brain through all my teammates right now. I I would say uh, I would say Prince. Prince Fielder. Yeah. <laughs> um. All right. What, what was your pregame music? I mean, it was it was a plethora of different hip hop songs. Whatever whatever had had the vibe for me that day. I, I it it bounced around all over. Thoughts on the uh, thoughts on the new extra innings rule? Do you like it or? I do like it. I do like. It. I thought I would hate it, but I actually I like it, and I think that's because I'm a broadcaster now, and I'm not I'm not actually on the field, <laughs> watching it from uh, our perspective. It's it's more compelling. Somebody's on base right away. You got to make pitches, and then the next thing, same thing happens for the the, the other team on the following. End. I I think I like it. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> so what uh, what are you most looking forward to? Obviously, uh, we're in like, we're like 13 games in already in the season. But what are you most looking forward to for the rest of the season? And hopefully, like you said, the Padres needs to be healthy. And uh, Fernando Tatis, uh, when he when he comes back, then he's going to be a big help for you guys. But what do you what are you most looking forward to seeing from this team to improve? I, I, I'm just looking looking forward to the race between with them and the Dodgers. I think the 19 games they have together, th- they start the weekend series today. Yeah. Um, I'm looking to see where they are on this measuring stick. Clearly the Dodgers are the measuring stick. Padre want to see where they are. I I think uh, they play them, I believe seven times in the next week. So uh, we're going to, we're going to find out at least early on where they are now. Most teams, we won't know who most teams are. Most teams won't know where they exactly are until we get into the latter part of June. But this is a good measuring stick for the pods here in this next week. So you guys are, this is a home stand, right? For you guys right this now? Is, yeah, beginning home stand. They got, the, they got the Dodgers for three, and then they got Milwaukee for three, who okay. is playing some good baseball too. Okay. Um, so speaking of the uh, Padres, Dodgers, what's it like going to be like seeing, um, uh, especially on Jackie Robinson Day today, seeing these players wearing number 42 and um, two teams going at it in the same division on Jackie Robinson Day? Uh, Padres actually, they wore theirs yesterday. They may be wearing them today. I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure, but, um, yeah, the Dodgers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the, the Dodgers I, I just, I mean, obviously when the Dodgers are in town and we're talking about Jackie Robinson, that, that kind of brings a, a little more significance to it, I believe. But I just think all around seeing, um, really the impact he's had. I mean, you look out on the field and it's, it's a world of different people uh, on, on the baseball field. And I think that's, that's the first thing you think of when you see that number 42. All right. Toughest stuff, toughest starting pitcher and toughest closer that you had to face. Oh, well, the toughest closer is easier. That's, that's, uh, that's my man, uh, Chapman. Mm-hmm. I think I, I think I'm still in the Guinness Book of World Records for oh, fa- fastest fastest pitch seen at 105 point whatever it was. Yeah. Um, s- toughest starting pitcher for me, I would say was Cliff Lee. Mm. He 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 had me tied up in knots at times, and he's really the only pitcher that ever made me feel like that. Wow, uh, favorite D- DMX song of all time. Oh, rough ride of the anthem. Yeah. <laughs> um, sure. So I know. I know, do. You, do you feel like you can still play in the game? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. I could. I could. I could still hit. Uh, but the the running the bases part, diving all over the place, like I would be on the IL constantly. Hmm. And the, so the last three things here, we probably let you go. Our team, we partnered up with two companies. The first one is. My aunt's company called Eplin X Cosmetics. The promo code is NR20. If, if your friends are interested in that, um, I'll send you the link. And also the other company we partnered up is called Bucking Beards. Um, it's a male's uh, hair, hair style product. The same promo code NR20. We're just trying to help them out so we can get more traffic for the show. And we're also, we're, we're part of a Hugh Jackson Foundation. It's called uh, the Foundation and obviously former NFL coach. And he just got the coaching job on Eddie Georgia's staff in Tennessee State. Um, okay. So congrats to him. And um, so we're part of this foundation. We're trying to help him prevent human trafficking and making sure um, this kid stays safe and the community stays safe. And it's still, it's still, it's still mind boggling that we're still seeing this happen. So we're, we're coming up with ways to prevent it. Uh, so hopefully uh, soon. Um, so I'll send you that link so you can check out Please. the foundation. And the last thing here, would you like to say anything to all the nurses, doctors, 
in essential workers right now? Wow. Um, where would we be without you guys right now? I mean, you guys have stepped up, been on the front line, taking care of us uh, and, and under duress in some cases. And uh, I want you to know from the bottom of my heart, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, this wouldn't this wouldn't even be possible without folks like you guys willing to literally li risk your life uh, for others. Not a lot of people, it seems like, are, are willing to do that, but you guys are. Yeah, well said. And there it is. That wraps up episode 755 for the NR Hour Sports Show with uh, Tony Gwynn Jr., obviously the son of legend Tony Gwynn, the late Tony, Tony Gwynn. Um, but uh, he was a former baseball player, and now he uh, calls games for the Padres. So keep thank you for thank you again for coming on the show. I really appreciate it, and uh, good luck tonight against the Dodgers. Keep up the great work, and like I said, we would like to have you back as a returning guest so you can meet the full team at some point. But uh, like I said, truly an honor, and uh, you and your family stay safe. Nathan, thank you for having me on. I look forward to the next time we get to chat, man. Take care. No problem.